The Lord of the Rings The Third Age is a 2004 video game published by EA and developed by EA Redwood Shores, the studio that would go on to become Visceral Games. Oh shit, that's the Dead Space guys. That's right, it's 2004 so we're talking about EA Games. Challenge everything. Era of licensed games. I'm sure, like me, everyone remembers the classic Lord of the Rings The Return of the King, a game that eight-year-old me formed unforgettable memories with back in the early noughties. Apart from Pelennor Fields, which is the worst f***ing video game level ever f***ing made and it f***ing sucks, it's f***ing bullshit, I f***ing hate it. But in amongst the legacy of The Return of the King, there is not a gosh darn soul out there I've met who has ever played this game. And I haven't a clue why, I mean just look at this cover. I saw this at eight years old and I thought, excuse me? Is that the gosh darned Balrog of Morgoth? Is that Gondalf on the cover? Is that legally distinct short person but not Gimli even though he is holding Gimli's axe a dwarf? Is that white woman who looks like the general manager of Lush? And is that randomly constipated action figure generic soldier man? Yes, the third age is essentially a JRPG in the style of your Final Fantasies and Quests of the Dragon variety, but in a coat of western RPG paint. You play as a bunch of nobody who gives a fucks, following the path of the famous fellowship from the incredible movies and timeless books that I don't have the attention span to read. And dwelt in Eresia within sight of Valinor, and many of the Sindar went over the sea also. Okay, when does Aragorn get a gun? What are you talking about? Along your adventure, you will get to battle alongside our famous faces we love so dearly, like Gandalf, like Gimli, like that guy from the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. This is a game I am so happy to finally talk about, because I ventured forth into this PlayStation 2 era nostalgia romp six times throughout my life. I really like this game, but I also know it's mediocre as fuck. Hold your hate, both of you. Both of you? Where's she? Oh. Hey there, big boy. This was my opportunity for therapy and self-reflection. It's good to love something with all its flaws accounted for, but in the last 18 years I could never quite put into words what it is that stops this game from being great. Well, at age 27, a balding young woman with defined cheekbones that I've become, I am finally ready to put it into words. So let's have a look at one of my most beloved oddities. Oh, and by the way, IGN gave this an 85 I'll just move it away. An 85 out of 100. You know, I like this game, but they, they, they really are like a kind of meme publication at this point, aren't they? You know, Lord of the Rings The Third Age has just enough story for the sentence, this game has no story, to be technically incorrect. We start off our tale joining Berathor, a Gondorian of some description, who is set upon by a crowd of Nazgul. Swiftly losing our first battle in the classic first fight is the one you're supposed to lose, we are quickly rescued by Idriel, and like any white woman with long plaited hair, she's a horse girl. Summoning her watery steed, she vanquishes the high school dressing gown goths of Mordor, and we venture forth together. I live because of your bravery, my lady. Why do women hate nice guys so much? Some tutorial prompts and battles later, we are shown a cutscene that tell us our purpose in this game, and it's blinking you miss it, so pay attention. I'm looking for Boromir of Gondor, have you seen him? Thus, we are looking for Boromir of Gondor, and I hope you remember him saying that, because while we go on to fill our party with the likes of Elagos the Ranger and Hadhod the Dwarf, the only thing pushing us forward seems to be the desire for the player to recreate cool shit from the movies. While the characters we'll meet all fall within recognisable fantasy archetypes, that is, Idriel is a noble elf, Hadhod is a grumpy dwarf, and Berithor is a virgin, we will not see but an ounce of anything but the most basic of characterisation over the course of our adventure. Eventually maxing out at six party members, there is barely a discussion of their own needs and wants in this world. Apart from Morwen, who we know has lost her family and wants revenge, every other character joins the party without much of any discussion and is just happy to join these bonkers white people in their adventure across Middle Earth. Everyone is so depersonalised from one another that up until very late in the game, you will never hear characters refer to each other by their names. 
it is such a definable feature of the game that by the time you do hear characters refer to one another by their name, it sounds really fucking weird. I Like somehow you're suddenly playing a fan fiction they've all wrote around one another. The weirdest but most entertaining part of the story is in Minas Tirith, when Aodin, a man who literally just shows up and says, Hey, can I hang out with you guys? I've got no friends. Rattles off everybody's name to the tune of some sort of sick rap beat, which makes this cutscene my favourite and most memeable part of the Third Age. Idriel, Eligos, down the wall! Keep that thing away! Hathor and Berithor, fire that catapult! We shall try to hold them while you bring the tower down! Bring that, bring that, bring that, bring that, bring the tower down! Admittedly though, no one who bought this game is playing it for whoever these chumps are. You're playing it to get to this bit, and hear Gandalf say the thing. Go on Gandalf, say the thing. You shall not pass. One of my favourite things in this game is coming across every recognisable character from the movie and waiting for them to say a thing from the film, because they couldn't afford to get the voice actor back and so just spliced whatever dialogue they could find in the film and jam it into a vaguely relevant section of the game. Fun drinking game is guess what the line will be and oh they're good ones. We've got the classic Gimli line. This is no rabble of mindless orcs. These are Rukhai. Their armour is thick, their shields broad. My favourite Gandalf quote. Fool of a took. Throw yourself in next time. Rid us of your stupidity. And the classic Legolas line. This is a fight we cannot win. It will become a massacre. No, I'm enjoying the party, but did, did you invite that guy? Seems like a bit of a fucking downer, to be honest. Eventually, the game does remember that you're not playing as the Fellowship from the film, and there is supposed to be some sort of distinct narrative. I'm about to spoil this game, but if you care about the story of this 18-year-old video game that I've hyped up as having barely any narrative at all, then it must be some real tasty lead paint you've been drinking. When your party get to the end of Rohan, over halfway into the game, suddenly we find Berathor is under the major neggy vibes of Saruman. You know something's not right because he does that thing actors do when they play someone who's evil by talking vaguely like a snake person. I obey the white hand of Saruman. Then once again in Helm's Deep, after fighting in one of the longest endurance battles of the game, Berathor goes into snake mode yet again. I do not fear them refusing to retreat and throwing you into one of the hardest fights of the game. If you've seen the films, which you sure as hell have, because no one who hasn't seen The Lord of the Rings is watching a YouTube video about this video game, we know at this point that Saruman is deed as a doornail. <sighs> and so Berathor is no longer under his influence. There, if we survive, the threads of our lives may yet continue. We then get plonked into Osgiliath, where everyone is chatting shit before they do the 12,000th battle of the game, and it is revealed that Berathor fought at Osgiliath before he was abducted and probed by the evil rape wizard Saruman. I don't know why I said that, that wasn't in the script. Berathor is like, not this time, bro, and then you fight a bunch of stuff. Then Idriel gets kidnapped in a rather hilarious way. This is the only time characters are split up from the party, which is a neat change of pace, but if you don't have the magic elf stone which boosts Idriel's spirit damage so high she can just blast people to death in one shot, it can be kind of frustrating. Fast forward a bit, Berathor finds Idriel, he can't hurt the Witch King because he got stabbed with an evil pencil once and there's still a little bit of lead in his chest, so Berathor whips out a knife out of nowhere and then comically plunges it directly into his full plate chest armour to dig out the wound. No longer under the influence of Sauron's brand of Morgul stationery, Berathor and Idriel smash some ass and move on. They smash the bad guy's ass, not each other, by the way. And that's the end of the story. Yeah, pretty much. It's not the end of the game. No, 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 no. We've still got like two and a bit hours of endless battles left. But all that happens is you go to Minas Tirith, help Gandalf again, which we've been seeing a few times throughout the game, and it's always good to hear from old G-Daddy. I'll call it Gandalf. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay. Gandalf. Gandalf, I, th I think you've still got the LED on, on your staff, mate. You've got in charging mode. Then, after Minas Tirith, we battle through Pelennor Fields, eventually joining up with Aragorn, who shows us the most overpowered move in the game. 
Then he says the thing he says in the movie. You bow to no one. Oh yeah, and Berathor and Morwen kiss because she's not dead or something. Uh, Aragorn then says they will march on the Black Gates, and you're probably thinking, oh cool, so we, we get to be part of the massive army at the end of The Return of the King, where the forces of man stand fast at the Black Gate. No, 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 no. But it's way better than that. With absolutely <laughs> no build-up at all, we immediately cut to a battle where our party stands atop the Tower of fucking Sauron itself as we battle the giant flaming ethereal eye of Sauron himself. The, the final battle is you and your pals slashing away at the air under this guy like a wasp has just gotten into the pantry and it's so rushed, so nonsensical, so just fucking silly that I can't even be mad at this point. So we ultimately beat Sauron by fucking up his ophthalmology prescription, then we get one FMV with a voiceover from Gandalf, and are thrown right back to the main menu. No epilogue, no proper ending for our characters, hell, not even some credits, we are thrown back to the main menu like a gaming whore thrown back onto the streets. If you needed proof that the developers didn't really know what to do, the ending shows it all. The story is a threadbare string of cutscenes dragged through 25 hours of battles, and every now and again there's the teeniest wee bit of characterization, giving us the hope that if... What's the name of the guy who wrote this? If Michael Becker actually tried, then there may have been something to push you through the really strong lulls this game has. This game's story, however, is not why you play it. As much as a unique and interesting tale during the War of the Ring would have been great, you play it for the satisfying combat. And most importantly, out of all the video games I've reviewed, I don't think there's another game whose presentation is so bang on perfect for the mood it's going for or the property it's emulating. The music is quintessential Lord of the Rings. The sound effects, bellissimo. The roar of the cave trolls. The throaty cry of the Urukai. The shiny ethereal sheen like noise your sword makes when it smashes into an ugly cockney orc's face. When everything comes together, it's just so comfy and charming in the way that the Lord of the Rings is. You know that specific charm of the movies? The originals, anyway, not this sexy dwarf bullshit. It's high fantasy, and you will hear ancient names and long forgotten history referenced all the time, but you're never overwhelmed with the lore, unlike every other fantasy property ever made. In particular, the new Lord of the Rings property, that is just so slow, I've given up on episode 3 already, I'm gonna go off in a tangent. See if you've, see if you've watched it and you've gotten past like episode 3 and it gets better, please let me know. I saw I saw a, like a news article saying that something happens interesting in episode 7. Episode 7. I am going to die one day. Does anything happen before episode 7? Because I only hate myself so much to waste that amount of my own existence on a show that is so far pretty fucking boring. Also, why does Elrond, well, I'll move it away, why does Elrond look like the most hobbit person in the show and also the, the leader of the elves? That's literally just Jeff Bezos with a wig on. I'd make a good. I'd make a good elf. What do you think? I think I'm either man or elf. But I think I'd be happy to play an orc. You know, say, what about the legs? I'd love that shit. Three stinking days. You know. The world is full of whimsy and happiness. The bad guys are evil, but in a very non-complicated way. What about the legs? There's no sex or super vulgar imagery, but things do still get real when you're kidnapped by a giant spider or overcome by the ring and shot dead in front of the fellowship, this game brings me back to that place. Not getting shot in front of your friends, the, the other thing. Or maybe the friends thing, I don't know, maybe you have a, a fetish for dying in front of a group of people. You ever just start a sentence and hope it ends where you want it to? Yeah, me too. And everything looks so recognisably Lord of the Rings as well. I mean, it's a, it's a PS2 game. So it looks more like a soggy origami version of the locations from the movie, but Moria looks like Moria. The Balrog looks like the Balrog. The gullies and those giant statues that I don't know the names of, 
yeah, they, they look like the things. They look like the you must be this tall to, you know, enter the ride things. Even the user interface looks bang on. Like, look at these battle menus. Don't they just look like the work of some underpaid Gondorian programmer? The font, the embellishments of the boxes and whatnot. It's something not to be ignored. Because if you're going to do a game where you battle for 25 hours straight, the battle screens better look good. Personally, I find the Final Fantasy remasters quite off-putting for just that reason. I don't know if they've always looked this way, but Final Fantasy X's UI in particular looks strangely slapped together and cheap to me, which is why I haven't bothered playing it. It does not mean the game is always good at telling you things though. The presentation of the most important pieces of information the game has to offer is where things are lacking. There are lots of moves you will see that I still, to this day, have no idea what they do. Every now and again an enemy will buff their pals, everyone kind of jumps something down like the Domino's guy just rang the doorbell and that's it. Best example I can give you is when you fight Grima Wormtongue, he has this move that just throws kind of like bad vibes all over your party and I haven't a scooby what it does. Even in evil mode when you play as him, or oh, evil mode, I forgot, I'll talk about that later, it's fucking cool. I still have no idea what it does, it just says bind foes with dark power. What does that mean? Does the Dark Lord like to bind people? Does he like to bind? Does he like to be bound? Is that a fetish thing? Is some sort of fetish shit? Tools! This is duct tape, zip ties and gloves! I have to have my tools! Outside of our paper mache cutscenes and occasional cameos, however, the game is chock full of FMVs with Ian McKellen voiceovers. It was an EA licensed game that came out in 2004, of course they were just going to fill the thing with the FMVs. Uh, I'll be honest, I haven't watched a single one of them since maybe 2010 because they're FMVs with the resolution of a postage stamp of movies that I own in 4K. There you go, that's how you do it. That's how you do a fucking photo shoot, lads. He's like, you wanna look kawaii des? Come down to Big Johnny's kawaii des modelling agency. <laughs> so really, even though there are some important quality of life faults, like not being properly told what state an enemy or your allies are in a lot of the time, the game recreates that fantastic charming vibe of OG early noughties Middle Earth. And now that, in actuality, I stand back and look at age 26, I can see where the game is rushed and very unfinished in places, but most of the time, it doesn't feel like that. I might resent that remark, but I think you're right. <laughs> okay, so I'm sure you can see by the timeline in front of you, this is where, uh, this is the longest part of the video, and that's because this is where things get interesting. Do you like turn-based battling? Do you like running between turn-based battling? Yes, well good, because that is all, and I do mean literally all you do in this video game. I'm not well versed enough in the infinite rabbit hole of weeb RPGs to tell you which series the Third Ages combat comes closest to, but in the grand scheme of things, it's fairly simple. You have party members who have health points that they need for the living, and action points they need for the killing. They have two different specialities they can use skills from, and they gain new abilities as you use them. Berathor can use sword attacks to destroy Sauron's scum, as demonstrated here by his masterful use of the blade. He also has leadership skills to boost the party's stats and improve their self-esteem. Idriel also has sword abilities, but can use her spirit attacks to heal or buff her allies, but mainly just blast water in bad guys' faces. And then Elagost has, quote, bow and ranger abilities, which is the first sign that maybe the game hasn't thought this all the way through. Both bow and ranger abilities involve the bow, so there's no distinction between the two of them. And also, Elagost can't use a sword at all, which annoys me because rangers do use swords, as we know from the films, and you even see Elagost with a sword in cutscenes. So it kind of irritates me that he just hands it off to his caddy when it becomes gameplay time. Ah, he almost took me head off! Characters also unlock new abilities in whatever speciality they use their actions in, so if you use leadership abilities a lot, you'll unlock more inspirational quotes to cheer the party up. Guys, good things come to those who hustle. I love it. I love it when the team just gel, you know, it's like everyone is Ross and Rachel. You... <laughs> you... you... You're a, Someone's walking about the... You're a diamond, babe. They can't break you. <laughs> Do people fucking... Is this, is this what happens when you work in a marketing department? Is this what your boss reads out you? You're a diamond, babe. They can't break you. Well, I'm sure people who have been kidnapped by Somali pirates may have something to say about that. But that also means if you don't use a set of skills, you will never unlock anything at all. 
And because of how poor some characters' starting skills are, some specialities will never get upgraded at all because it's simply a waste of time. The last three characters in your party are great examples. Hadhod the Dwarf, Morwen the Rohirrim Lady, and Aodin, the Simon Pegg impersonator. Hadhod has spirit powers, which makes him sound like he can talk to dead people, but all it means is he can summon a big fireball or a stone shield to protect an ally from one hit. Apart from that, his fireball attack is maybe one of the most useless attacks in the game because there's barely anything in this game that's weak to fire. And since it's way, way more effective to have your angry short friend smash things with an axe, <laughs> we've all been there, than it is to throw fireballs at giant demons literally made of fire, <laughs> I never unlocked a single skill in his spirit field, which is a crying shame because his final ability involves summoning a spirit dragon made of pure flame, which is, I think fair to say, infinitely more interesting than the actual best attack in the game, which looks like this. Incredible stuff. Likewise, Mormon has dual axe abilities, but also thief skills. Oh, so sounds fancy, Jordan. So what does she, does she cripple the enemy? Can act like a debuff character? You know, ensuing disarray and subterfuge into the enemy ranks to divide and conquer the forces of evil? No, she steals their lunch money. Haha, <laughs> take that, sorry, man. Yet yeah, Mormon's thief abilities are shockingly useless. When Mormon is first added to the party, her only thief skills are being able to steal an item off an enemy or steal a skill point, but you, you get skill points for using attacks, so I don't know if maybe it gets you two? It, it's basically a skill exclusively for grinding. Likewise, stealing an item is just wasting your turn. You don't know what item an enemy will be carrying, and it'll more than likely be something fairly useless that you will never use, like improved Wi-Fi reception for three turns. Then there's Aodin, who looks like he's the assistant manager in a Greg's. Throughout the many playthroughs I've had of the Third Age over my life, Aodin has always been exceptionally boring to me. He's not an elf, nor is he of some special bloodline. He is just a guy with a spear who can do magic somehow. His spirit powers are actually fairly decent, but also just as boring as he is. His main thing is he can drain health and action points from enemies, or move his own to other characters in the party. He really is just the Microsoft Excel of video game RPG characters. In fact, I like to think that when he drains action points from a bad guy, it's just a metaphor for him boring the enemy so hard that it robs them of the will to fight. But Aodin ends up getting equipment so strong that by the end of the game he was easily doing damage into the five figures, so there's no point in touching spirit powers when you can just bash a guy's head in so hard he turns into an award-winning pumpkin. I think there's actually a very easy fix to improve the flow of the game, and it's simply to give character skill points on each level up as well as from combat use, so that even if you don't use terrible skills you start with, you will still unlock some more options as the game continues. Party members already share XP, so the developers kinda knew what they were doing, but they just stopped halfway. As well as your character's natural skills, you can also get elf stones, which give them a whole new set of moves. But don't get too excited, because there's only three of them in the game, and one of them is crafting. So if you want to waste your turn by having Hadhod make King's Foil for his homeopathic Etsy store, go right ahead. For the sake of thoroughness in this review, I did some grinding with the elf stones of Shadow and Light, which, unlike most of the classes I took in school, actually teach you something useful. Aye, this is a true story. My final year of high school, I was 16, 17, and um, I was in RE class, religious education, and uh, they never taught us anything about religion, uh, and I shit you not, this is true, we sat down, and my teacher put on, for an hour and a half, a 9-11 conspiracy theory video, we watched it for a full hour and a half. The credits started to roll. She paused it, turned it off, looked at all of us and went, pretty convincing argument, eh? Unfortunately, however, the Third Age loves that age-old game design philosophy, where if you get an ability that's really useful, instead of designing enemies to be balanced around it, they just make powerful guys immune to it. With the Elf Stone of Light, I got Berathor to learn Suffocate Evil, one of the very few Light Spirit attacks you can actually learn in the game, and it can stop characters from taking action altogether. Oh my god, I thought, something awesome and useful against tougher enemies. Fine, oh no, he's immune to it. He's, he's also immune to it. Oh no, he's immune to it. Everyone's had their Suffocate Evil vaccines before they left the Black Gates this morning, it would seem. I'm sorry I interrupted again, I just wanted to... <laughs> to point out that the journey to destroy the ring has really fucked up poor little Pippin over here.
The most powerful abilities in this game are easily ones that can slow or stun enemies. Some enemies are immune to it and it's perfectly sensible, like a Nazgul is immune to sleep because presumably the tortured souls of long dead kings don't need a bedtime to get evil done, but it's more likely that if you're fighting an enemy you'd really like to stun, they'll be immune to it. Then there's equipment. Now you might think character stats are the most powerful aspect of gameplay in this RPG, but you'd only be almost right. The mechanic that will dictate by the end whether a character is kicking evil bum or is it basically a paper mache orc sword sharpener is their equipment. And armour influences damage taken by a lot, so even though Elagost has some useful crippling attacks and later on can hit every single enemy at once with a sleeping arrow, his armour is so low it'll only take about two hits before he's had enough, has a stroke and falls over. Likewise, I love Mormon. I love her character, she do wields axes for God's sake, she's got this bad bitch Rahiram warrior girl attitude going on, she's got this sexy armour but it's not too sexy. She is the manic pixie dream girl of the Lord of the Ring universe and you know what, I'm all for it. But she is easily the worst character in the game because her equipment fucking sucks. Even by the end of the game, her axes do way less damage compared to the other characters' weapons and her armour is terrible. Trying to use her when she first joins the party is an utter waste of time as she does barely any damage and dies if she so much as looks at a butter knife. <laughs> Aye, but let, let's get in the nitty gritty. You know, what is it about this game that I know fundamentally isn't very good? What is it about it that I love so much? Well, as it turns out, the answer is fairly interesting. In the same way that in the 1800s, people would drag some eight foot tall guy into the Royal Institute of Medicine and doctors would all poke and prod at him going What the fuck, how's this tree person still alive? That's what this game is, to me. It is an 800 pound man lying on a surgery table that doctors are just losing their shit over. The Third Age's two biggest points of contention are its pacing and its difficulty. Its pacing is terrible, but you probably already knew that since I told you the entire game is just running between turn based battles. No villages, no puzzles, no side quests. Well, technically, the game has this thing that it calls side quests, but it's literally just exploring the map until you've fought everything. You just fight ugly evil boys the entire game, split up with cutscenes every now and again, and so of course it's going to get old after a while. And even the battles themselves are slow. Most of the gameplay you've been watching in the background is me playing the game on turbo mode. Oh yeah, I forgot to say, I've been playing this game on PC SX2. I have it somewhere, I couldn't find it. And also, I'm not, I'm not digging out the PlayStation 2 when I can play this in Turbo Spit. Like I've said it before, fuck, you can emulate shit, fucking yo ho ho. You're, you're a fucking da 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 You know what I mean? Emulating really improves this game because at default speed, people look like they're moving in slow motion. Idriel charging up her loud water fury attack feels like watching an old lady do tai chi in the park. But in Turbo mode, it just looks like she's giving it a real good wham. Berathor's victory animation looks like he's trying to sword fight in a swimming pool, but at 200% speed, it actually looks normal. So play it in turbo mode, it's way more enjoyable than the end of that. But I also mean the pacing of the level design itself. Moria, for example, is four straight hours of running through empty halls and battling goblins. Yeah, seriously, four fucking hours. The pinnacle of the game's sluggish pacing is when you finally arrive at Helm's Deep and you do battle after battle that contain multiple waves. Now it makes sense, I'm not mad about it, it is Helm's Deep, but some battles have 15 odd enemies you fight in it, and every time you think you're done, you're thrown right into another fight. The worst part is the hardest battle is the very last one of the area, and there's no save point before it, so you spend 20 minutes fighting 15 enemies with Aragon by your side, then he pisses off to check Instagram, and you fight an even harder fight without him. Directly after it, however, you're just thrown into Isgiliath. And I don't mean the party gets together, you have a wee cutscene and recovers their forces and then moves on. But no, you finish fighting the equivalent of the entire population of India for 45 minutes straight and then are thrown, with no fanfare, no cutscene, right into more battles. This was the first time the 8 year old me gave up with this video game. I said I've played through this game 6 times, but I've only truthfully finished it 3. The other 3 were me getting to Isgiliath and just giving up. And I didn't know why at the time, back when I was 8 years old, but now, as a 26 year old, it's now clear as day to me that this game, it just burns you out. It plays its whole hand and crescendos at Helm's Deep and then shows you it has nothing else to offer. And to add to all of that, Asgiliath is piss easy. 
You fight this massive gauntlet in Helm's Deep and now you're back to just picking whatever attack you like because everything dies in one hit. And the game continues on like that. There is no deeper battle strategy to uncover. You are going to keep on fighting guys constantly through Asgiliath, through Minas Tirith and through Pelennor Fields, which by that point you will be so, so very done with this game. If you're not smashing through guys with ridiculous damage because the last two levels just overwhelm you with ridiculously good gear left and right, you'll be proven why the best move in the game is anything that stuns and gets stun locked by a couple of elephants that really love Dance Dance Revolution. Wait a minute John, weren't you going to talk about all the stuff you liked about the game? All that stuff sounded shit. Yeah it is, it's, it's horseshit. But as it turns out, the most interesting part of the game is the difficulty. The game bounces around from mind numbingly easy too impossibly difficult, sometimes between areas, sometimes just between battles. You might be destroying everything in your path, then you'll look at one particular arc the wrong way and him and all his homeless pals will beat the shit out of you. But in amongst the awful difficulty curve the game has, every now and again, the game is just difficult enough to show you that there's a genuinely pretty decent turn-based battle system hidden in there. It just needs the perfect blend of enemy choice and battle design for it to show up. But truthfully, when it does happen, I think it's mostly accidental. For the first six hours, the game is easy. You pick the right attack and kill whatever's in front of you, like a true white man. That was a weird way to say it. I, sometimes I just say things that aren't in the script. <laughs> then you'll get to the big moment you bought the game for. Look, the bridge of Khazardu. Battling the Balrog of Morgoth with Gandalf at your side, he even says the thing. Engage. It's so exciting, Gandalf the friendly man that he is, he physically widens the bridge of Khazadun so that you and all your party members can stand alongside him. And suddenly, the game is impossible. No! The Balrog has easily the best move of any character in the game and does a massive party-wide attack that will nearly kill everyone in one shot and also drains all their action points. So all your party members do barely any damage, and of course any move that might be useful, he's immune to it. So the only way to beat this fight is to give Gandalf an item, which lets him attack freely, and just spam lightning bolts until the demon dog dies. Idriel has her Loudwater Fury attack, which the big fire is technically weak to, but compared to Gandalf she might as well be trying to piss out a house fire. Then you move on to the gullies, and hey, things are starting to feel a little bit more balanced. The baddies are noticeably stronger than the malnourished goblins of Moria, and there's enemies with dangerous buffs that can put up shields that reflect damage, so throwing your short friend at the problem until it stops might not be the best idea anymore. And I just realised I should probably put that clip in from the movie. You know the one. <laughs> then you get to Rohan and holy shit, why is everything so hard? Suddenly everyone in the party feels like they're flailing about foam swords and nerf guns, enemies do way more damage and then you get Morwen in your party who has armour so weak she may as well be dressed like a female Korean MMORPG character. That was a sentence both difficult to write and say. And yet somehow, even though it's still way too hard for what the game has reasonably prepared you for, you have to use strategy and it becomes way more interesting because of it. Like you might be surrounded by wargs, so do you rotate Elagost and Mormon in front of them since they have high damaging attacks against animals, or do you move them out the way so they don't die as quickly? Amazingly, the game starts to achieve the delicate balance of high difficulty and a good battle design that can tip forward into a genuinely strategic and engaging turn-based battle system. Likewise, fighting Middle-earth's King of the Goths, Grima Wormtongue, is way more difficult than you'd expect taking down this school shooter would be, but having to take some time to think strategically is far more interesting than bashing whatever attack you can think of first. That is, admittedly, all the less frustrating when you're playing on an emulator and have save stays. If you're on original hardware, you will, and I know you will, because I remember feeling like this as a kid, you will get so burnt out and frustrated. Everyone moves slow as shit. When the difficulty spikes and you haven't saved, you lose like 30 minutes of progress. But playing on an emulator nullifies most of that and moves this game from a 5 to like a solid 7.5 out of 10. But then you get into Asgiliath and everything is easy as hell again. And there's still more to talk about, playing with members of the Fellowship is super cool but an admittedly cheap thrill. It goes more to highlight that the battle system would be a lot more interesting if you could have 4 party members fighting at once instead of just 3. Unlocking new abilities gets exponentially grindier the more you go, so even though the game takes about 25 hours to complete, and all you do is battle in the game, you're still not going to see the final, best and by far and away the flashiest moves your characters can learn. 
like Edriel summoning a water stallion, or Elagost firing a massive golden arrow. The first few abilities your characters get unlock after about 15 or so uses of a skill, but by the end you need to grind an ability 90 to 100 times and it's just it's fucking ridiculous. Then there's the interesting showcase battles, as I like to call them, and they're some of the best in the game, but are very rare. So for example, having to strategically take out three goblins at the same time, so you can attack the goblin drummer summoning enemies behind them. Or those fights when you get encircled, you can only attack or be attacked by the nearest three enemies, so you have to decide whether you should cycle around a certain character to take big hits, or take out a chunk of enemies so you can give a party member a little safe space to buff and use items. Easily however, the most non-negotiable, cool as fuck thing this game has going for it is evil mode. At the end of each chapter, you get to replay a few fights from the baddies perspective. Yes, you get to play as the demon dog, as the hentai monster, as the big fire eye in the sky, you can fly twice as high or whatever the lyrics are, I don't know. It's fantastic, especially when you have trouble taking them down as the good guys and then you just get to embrace the power fantasy by smashing a giant flaming sword into Ian McKellen's classically trained face. On completion, you're rewarded with usually pretty great gear, which you can put into a save file, even a brand new one. So if you want to get the best gear in the game and put it in a brand new save file so you're overpowered from the start, that's a nice option. Although I don't recommend doing that because when you're overpowered and easy, that's when the game is at its most boring. And um, and that's it. I, I don't have anything else to say about this game. I, fi I finally figured out the Lord of the Rings The Third Age. Shit. The Lord of the Rings, The Third Age, is exactly the type of game you need in your life sometimes. You can't always wait around for what's perfect, and so, sometimes you're just happy with what you have. Like finally getting a wife in your 40s, yeah you're not all that attracted to her, her smile is dodgy, and her laugh is so ugly that she sounds like a child drowning to death in tar, but you know what, you never really like kids anyway. There is solid stuff in here, you know what, there's actually great stuff in here, but I would pretend that 25 hours straight of turn-based battles with no other mechanics makes a good video game. You're going to have to do a little bit more than that to get a pass. And honestly speaking, if I can get through this game, but I can't get through the third episode of The Rings of Power because it's simply too boring, I think that kind of tells you everything you need to know. This game captures 2004 in a nutshell for me. It's full of big spectacle, silly PS2 bollocks, and by today's standards, pretty rudimentary game design. It's not great, some might argue it's not even good, but you know what? It's good enough for me. I, The Lord of the Rings, The Third Age, get three men and a baby. Out of 10. Lord of the Rings, The Third Age. It's done, it's dead, it's gone. Anyway, I hope you have all enjoyed. Please tell me if you've played this game. I've never met anyone else who's played this game. Did you like the adventures of Gondalf? I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts. And as always, Thanks for watching. And remember, if you. And remember. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I finally got a sign off. And remember. Wait. Hey. So, thanks for what? And remember, guys. Thanks for watching. And be brave. Be bold. Be authentic. Be you. Right, guys, I know it's the Battle of Minas Tirith, and uh, guys, pay attention, okay? I know it's the Battle of Minas Tirith, and we're all very nervous, but um, if a cauliflower can turn into a pizza, you can be anything you want to be. <laughs> but, do people actually read this shit out to their fucking subordinates? Well, <laughs> well, what a fucking shit.